I am born in Lithuania, in Vilnius. And this country in my times was sacred. There were sacred rivers, there were sacred forests, there were sacred wells, there were sacred animals, there was sacred earth which had to be kissed in the morning and in the evening, and prayers had to be said. I saw all that in my childhood. We fled from the Soviet regime to, the, to Germany, and in Germany it was bombing, but anyway, we, we had just that one road to go to the West. I got my PhD in Tübingen University in 46. I was actually number one student who got PhD after the war, and this was the first university to reopen after the war. So I plunged into the studies right away, right away. So then when I came to America, I was already Dr. Dimbutas, and I had published by then several books. And I thought that I have something in my hands. <laughs> of course, now I, I probably never, never would dare to go and speak to professors and ask for a job or possibility to work. At that time, I could. Tonight is a historic occasion, the world premiere of The Civilization of the Goddess. <laughs> I guess I don't have to say it's Maria Gimbutas' new book. <laughs> this monumental work is a wealth of information on the spirit of the people and their accomplishments. A civilization Maria's called Old Europe. They did not fight wars, they did not murder or enslave people or poison nature. That is not her definition of a civilization. <laughs> now I'd like to ask Ruth Barrett of Circle of Arati on stage who's going to sing an invocation for us. together this evening to celebrate the publication of Maria Gimbutas' most recent volume in her series of groundbreaking studies on old Europe's goddess civilization. This one entitled Civilization of the Goddess, the World of Old Europe. This massive tome completes her goddess trilogy of progressively more detailed and ever more expansive studies that began with goddesses and gods of old Europe and was followed by the language of the goddess. We have also turned out in large number tonight to honor Maria for her monumental contribution to knowledge, for restoring our true but buried history to us, for literally excavating it from the depths of Mother Earth, and for bringing it out into the light, so that together we may bring about a reflowering of life on our planet as soon as possible. Welcome, Maria Gambutas.
Thank you. Now, the making of this book was not two or three or five years. I would, I would count 30 years at least, if not more. But this was not for writing only. Well, it included collecting of materials, excavation for 15 years, reading, and reading was not reading of two or three general books, but I would say 3,000 of articles and reports in about 20 languages of Europe. And I believe that the archaeologists should base on primary sources and never trust secondary sources, because they are very frequently distorted. What I was finding was Neolithic and settlements, stratified settlements where life continued for about 1,000 years. And nearly all of my excavated sites were like this. Like like layer cakes, yes, where you have at the bottom, say, seven millennium, on top you have, well, fourth or third or, say, fifth. I think the most exciting thing for me is the sum of evidence, not one find. And the sum is what I did with, with the symbolism, with the goddess, deciphering of symbols, deciphering of types of goddesses worshipped, also discovery of temples, which I discovered also. Well, to see how comfortable our ancestors lived was a pleasure. To, to see how spacious houses were, how, how beautiful the location was. That was all. So these are some aspects. But as I say, the sum of of the life, say seven thousand or eight thousand or nine thousand years ago, was for me probably the greatest joy. But what has been happening recently is that the amount of information that is generated by different disciplines has become so great that that information has led then to specialization. So when I say that Maria's work is old-fashioned, what I really mean is that she would be bringing us back towards something that was healthy and connected and where the different disciplines work together rather than working in isolation. <laughs> women and nature. This definition, <laughs> this definition excludes past cultures in which androcratic societies are not represented, yet whose way of life seems to have had a higher quality than the androcratic societies. Such was old Europe and its heirs, especially in the Aegean and the Mediterranean area, particularly the Menon culture of Crete in the second millennium. These civilizations enjoyed a long period of uninterrupted peaceful living and blossoming art. The non-material aspects of culture, artistic creation, aesthetic achievements, values concerned with life, ideology, and philosophy, which make life min meaningful and enjoyable, these are what should be stressed. Well, first of all, the quality of life. I feel that they had 
a higher quality of life than we have today, or than, than our ancestors of the Bronze Age had. And the lack of weapons, the lack of very well, fortifications of the hill force, for instance, this shows that people for thousands and thousands of years could have lived in peace without much conflict between each other. The most striking thing to me, and I'll always remember this moment about her work, is when I learned that human beings had lived in peace. It was a truly shocking, radical moment to me because I bought into the myths of Western culture. There's always been wars. I mean, we basically live by the myth of a conquering hero. We are a warrior society that lives in wars and has been living in wars for like 50 generations or whatever. And when I realized, and I thought it's in our genes, it's in our blood, that people had lived in peace, it was truly a changing point in my life. And the other thing is that the egalitarianism between the sexes existed and that is visible especially from grave goods and burial rites. People somehow didn't glorify individuals at that time. In burial we can see that all female or, or male were equal and there was no ranking. In that we were all equal. There are many books on, for instance, the origin of war in which the beginning of the agricultural period is considered to be also a beginning of warrior society, which is nonsense in my mind. This is a distortion of actual evidence. This, such statements are illustrations that general writers are not informed about the actual evidence. The goddess civilization took keen delight in the natural wonders of this world. Well, I would say matriarchy is the mirror image of patriarchy, and patriarchy we can also call androcracy. This is a, a domination by men. And in matriarchy, I do not see that men were suppressed by females. They were also very important in the society. So therefore, I tend to use the term matristic instead of matriarchal, or just use matrilinear, matrilineal system. Uh, that is what I see that it existed. However, the queen or priestess was on top, and she probably had a council of women, which is very well evidenced in later historical times, and also in mythology and in archaeological finds. Maria's legacy is and continues to be that she is forcing society to think along a whole new paradigm. It isn't the paradigm of male hero and submissive female. It's the paradigm of the power of the female. Not, not power over the male, because, because the two figure equally in creation. And, and, and what is life all about but the, the magic of creation? I describe the social structure of old Europe as matrilineal, avuncular, endogamic, ruled by a queen priestess and assisted by a council of women and assisted by her brother or uncle who was an overseer of trade, of architecture, of navigation, of mining, and so on. It's been very important for women to reclaim their history and to have a legitimating symbol of their creativity, the creator as female goddess.
the goddess in all her manifestations was a symbol of the unity of all life in nature and the whole universe. Her power was in water and stone, in moon, sun, and fire, in animals and birds, snakes and fish, in hills, trees, and flowers, in bees and butterflies. Hence, the holistic perception of the sacredness and mystery of all there is on earth. I think one of the broadest applications of Maria's work is in the whole ecological movement, which is something that m most people realize that we have to have a different relationship with the planet. And Maria's work really gives um, a mythological basis, a, a historical and mythological basis to re-relate to the earth because she gives us these traditions of the goddess who is like nature, cosmos, she's one. She's all the forces of this dynamic life energy. She's nature. She's nature itself. Nature which creates, which is seasonal, which is rhythmical, associated with moon phases. And the goddess, mostly what we see is the spring goddess, the summer goddess, the fall goddess, the winter goddess. So she is a seasonal goddess, and she is also Earth herself. And, well, her powers are everywhere, in plants and in stones and in hills and in grass and in flowers, wherever uh, she is there. We have been taught in our, Western, in our Western society to think about birth and death. Birth is good, death is bad, period. And she is forcing us with our recognition of the of the functions of the goddess to think of their real functions which were power over birth over life and the living over death and over rebirth in this maria is linking herself with with millennia of eastern thought that that has known this all along but she's she is one of the people who is forcing the western world to accept the much more gratifying notion of the life continuum. The main motif of goddess religion was the celebration of life energy. The life force that fuses male and female, generating life and accepting death as part of the cycle of life. I say, not male or female, but both together. And we happen to live in time which is the end of an era. <laughs> the end of the 5,000 years of what James Joyce has termed the nightmare. <laughs> and the end of the 20th century, a century of wars, tortures, and massacres. As Thomas Berry says, we have to reinvent the human species or perish. We must re-examine history and start putting back some parts that we have left out, namely the earth, the body, the feminine, and the unconscious. <laughs> Uh, 
And I think that, you know, that's what I have to say, is she had the courage to overturn all knowledge, centuries and centuries of embedded, you know, accepted ideological presuppositions and everything. She's turned it over, and she's fought off diseases and attacks, and she's carried on and carried forth and brought it to such a fullness of flowering, you know, that it can't be ignored, and that's not easy. Well, my work just now is becoming known. So this is just the beginning. And after some time, some archaeologists will use it. And I think that many will turn the direction toward the sp spirituality, toward the connection of archaeological evidence with mythological evidence and the continuity in historical times and up to present folklore. So that, that is, to me, very important. Without understanding European history, European culture in general, European mythologies, European folklore, you cannot really decipher certain things what you find in digging. You have to be widely interested. And not only in geology, mathematics, and statistics, and other things. So we have to know the spirituality of culture. So much work is going to come out of her work. One of the fascinating qualities that Maria has to me is her sense of time, her sense of certainty about what her work is, and also how it's going to be accepted. It's this archaeological viewpoint of time over these great span, spans of time, this great expanse of, of millennia after millennia, where it's, well, if it is, my work isn't accepted right now, it will be accepted by this generation, the next generation, and then they will see what my work is about. And if there's too much prejudice in academia now or throughout the culture to see it, my work will hold. And she has this great certainty and this great vision of who she is and what her work is about through time. First of all, there is not the right training of archaeologists. I do not know any university where it was required, for instance, for archaeology students to study mythology or folklore or history of religions. And that, that is felt, you see, in all, practically in all works that appear in archaeology, the main interest is economy and very little more. Religion was outside of interest. That was separate. Then again, there was for a certain time said we have to research garbage pits and not reconstruct temples. <laughs> certain direction of research where you had to to reconstruct the economic life, but not the spirituality of the period. It was totally divided. Well, my hope would be that this book would go into paperback editions, that it would become widely available, that it would generate other books, perhaps smaller and more wieldy, and that uh, within the subject of archaeology, I'm sure it will have its uh, influence. Perhaps there will be a broader spectrum of uh, interpretation that uh, we might be concerned with generally. Um, certainly, I think that as far as the public goes, they have been offered some really colossal changes in Western civilization, uh, simply because of the time span and the great uh, geographical span that has been covered in this most recent book. I had a vision of bringing people together and, and also letting Maria see in a way, how she's loved by a community. And there were a lot of different communities there. There were unions there, there was feminists there, there was the men's movement, there were 
academics there and to bring different communities together in, in an inclusive way to share this, this celebration and this love of the earth and this idea of living in harmony and that our ancestors did that and I just always had this dream to, to give this to Maria. The whole entire goddess community of California comes out from Maria and these are people who are not scholars. These are people who do rituals, these are people who um, speak to the goddess, commune with the goddess, pray and they have realized the importance of Maria's work to what they do. To me, Maria is a, a very paradoxical combination of traits in her personality. She has this incredible mind that can read all these books and know all these languages and synthesize all these data, and yet she has this very warm heart. And in a second, she's willing to enter into the spirit of play. She has this delightful nature to her. You see her dancing and playing with her dogs. You see her digging in her garden. and although she has this wide intellect and she has this great heart and, and, and at the same time she's like an utterly simple person. Because of her generosity and her kindness and her warmth, people don't just respect and admire her. People like me love her. Well, I, I want to say thank you to you all who are so interested in what I am doing. This is the greatest gift, and I'm happy. Mm -hmm.